Welcome one, welcome all to The Politics of Cinema. On this show, we believe that films are never, ever neutral. There's a political as well as artistic message captured in every film, and we're on the lookout for all of it. The good, the bad, the other. My name is Aaron Spears. And my name is Isaac Miller, and on this episode, we finish up our May Day um, Movies About Workathon. <laughs> I like that. I mean, you know, that, it's that's a thon. what it is. It's a thon, yeah. It's definitely a thon, where both of us have taken different uh, different tacks toward this, uh, this, this uh, venerable genre, not genre of film, where I have gone for literally the most conventional films I possibly could on this subject, which is movies about minors. All your labor movies are basically about minors. That's not true, but a lot of them. About mining the earth, not underage folk. Yes, yes. Though in this one, there are some minors who oh, are minors. And, and How Good News My Valley. There's underage. There are minors in minor films. Because, uh, because it's a brutal, horrific thing. Yes. Um, and, uh, and in which Aaron has taken a slightly different tack. <laughs> Uh, I think I laugh, cut you off with that one, but yeah, I took a different, a different tack. Uh, I was looking at films that this, oh, this is such a narrow genre, so I really shouldn't be disappointed in, uh, some of the, the, the lack of quality I've discovered, uh, films that were looking at the service industry, but then also specifically took place because I was able to find enough movies, movies that all took place at the job site itself. Um, I have to say though, I feel like we're getting similar results of just sort of like, Eh, t- shoulder shrugs. To- well, no, I guess I picked Empire Records, and that was such a pile um, that uh, that's the bottom of the heap so far for all of them. Oh, by far. I mean, I think the movies. Look, both of the movies that we have today. Today we're we're covering two movies. We should actually say what we're covering. Uh, Aaron shows Barbershop, uh, two thousand two. I'm going to challenge. We're not just going to tell and talk about its weaknesses and strengths, but I'm going to challenge even whether it should be here at all. And then uh, I chose the Molly, Molly Maguire's from 1970. And I think both of our conclusions, just to spoiler for the episode, <laughs> is I'm, I'm a little more sympathetic to both. I consider both of them like good movies, like competent, more or less, Barbershop a little bit less so, um, but not great, you know? Right. Not great. Well, the problem that I think we ran into was we started off with Car Wash and Salt of the Earth. Uh, I think we argued pretty well in that episode, legit masterpieces in both cases. And that set the bar really high. Right. And then we didn't even we didn't even like clear the bar. We like knocked over the whole setup with Empire Records. Your minor film's focus has, has been has been a bit more consistent, I would have to say. But also, and I don't want to make this sound like a too much of a defense of it, but the way we were selecting these movies for this month and looking at workers on film, these were movies that neither one of us had seen before. I think in all of the cases, it was movies that we had meant to see. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you know, I did how green is, uh, how green was my Valley, which I think we both said like, it didn't perfectly connect with us, but is obviously made at the highest level. Yeah. Yeah. Quality wise, very consistent. Right. Yeah. I don't take it back. I I mean, see the previous episode, but uh, Empire Records was one I had seen back in the late 90s when it came out on VHS, but I hadn't seen it since. So I guess technically I lied a little bit there, but it's still a shitty movie. So it doesn't really matter. I mean, look, when we think about, you know, I mean, even our early quality. Well, so here's the thing is before we got onto these themes, but when we started with Labor, right? Mm-hmm. Which was our, our official May Day episode. Right. Triple feature. Um, we had The Killing Floor. Yep. And we had finally... Uh, finally got the news Mm -hmm. both of which are i mean the killing floor is also a bit of a masterpiece yeah i mean it's incredible or you know superb movie finally got the news you know whatever technically it's it's a great piece of political propaganda that's like really captures the moment um but i guess you know uh we did gung-ho yep which was awesome Fun time we've had by all. <laughs> um, wasn't very good, um, but was uneven because there was a lot of talent behind the screen, you know? Right, right, right. And of course, there's neoliberal propaganda. But, you know, so I think, honestly, I think the, the movies that we have today, like Gung Ho is roughly in that. I think Gung Ho and Barbershop, maybe, maybe I put Barbershop a little ahead. Then I put Molly McGuire's and... Then, you know, and then we start getting into like, it's, well, oh, and then obviously like Empire Records at the total bottom. But it, 
it is interesting. We've just got like it, it sort of seesaws in quality. Like there's yeah, a little yeah. bit in the middle, but it's like either we pick either we picked like the best fucking movie, <laughs> or we picked like or uh, Empire Records. Oh man, <laughs> sorry that one still stings. I don't know what's going on, but uh, so. I had hypothesized at one point. Um, no, I hypothesized at a very specific point when we did car, when uh, we did car wash, um, the second episode in our May Day Athon or whatever it was you just called it earlier, our Athon, and looking at car wash from '76 because I had a couple other movies in mind that were about, around the same time period as car wash, and one of them I mentioned before the Empire Records episode, the film Record City from '78, which is all set in a, actually maybe I didn't mention, I think I mentioned the documentary, but I watched another film from 78 called uh, record city. That's all set in a record store and it's terrible. It's not empire records, terrible, but it's not that far off to be honest. Like if the people making empire records weren't, you know, fans of record city, um, it, it'd be weird. Cause it was like, this is pretty much empire records. The empire or uh, record city actually has, instead of the Rex Manning day um, cameo, actually that's more of a supporting character in that movie. There's actually a Gallagher cameo where Gallagher plays Gallagher in record city. I, I think, I think you mentioned this. You might've mentioned this on the podcast. Okay. So that one was there. So I thought, you know what, there's this late seventies. I want to, I want to take a look here because there's a couple movies I had in my, uh, uh, that I I'd previously had in my, my diary on, on letterbox. I was like, I know there was another one I watched there. I swear it was all around like a gas station. And it was, it was 1979. It was called gas pump girls, which is what you would assume it's about. Pump girls are having fun now that school is out and the whole town is there for the making. Gee, I hope I can remember everything I have to do. Don't worry, it's just four easy steps. Grab it, stick it in, squeeze it, and let it peter out. Gas Pump Girls, a motion picture delight when our girls change over a gas station and turn it into a fun station with sounds that will get you dancing while your tank is getting filled. Um, it's a uh, competition between gas stations, I, I, if I remember correctly, but uh, it's the girls that work at this one gas station. So it's all set at the job um, about, you know, these specific girls. And that was 79. So I started poking around to see what else was coming up in the late 70s. In 78, uh, I got two examples that I watched. One was called Star Hops, where it's three it's three women who work as um, I guess it's car hops, right? Like a, a drive up restaurant. I'm not yeah. old anymore, right? So, you know, that was a specific specific era. And so in the first scene, the owner is just like, fuck it, I'm out. Actually, I think it was Dick Miller, of all people, too, playing that car- that character. And he just, like, sells it to them for whatever. So they're in charge of the restaurant or the, the this, this uh, car hop restaurant now. And by the end of the movie, they all are matched up uh, as all heterosexual characters. They're all matched up with guys. And they end up forming a co-op with a car repair shop. that's going to open up right next door. So you have a car repair shop and the drive up restaurant, you know, where they serve you in your cars, but they're specifically talking about like their, the, the end of the whole resolution of the movie is, you know, we're going to form a co-op with um, these three guys who are going to run the business next door to us. And you're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. There's another movie from 78 called FM that has a very young Martin Mull, very hot young Martin Mull. Actually, it's all set in a, radio station in LA it's it's when it's when they find out they're the number one FM station in LA everyone's happy and the ratings are soaring at Q Sky Radio we have done it and we are going to cook and cook and cook and cook but the top brass think things could be even better just go sending the dude here to get these big accounts to put spots on our station I'm Regis Lamar from Chicago look pal I don't give a sh- you're the Messiah from Jerusalem come here to make my life perfect. What do they care about music? Well, to tell you the truth, I can take it or leave it. All they care about is money. Wall to wall commercials. Yeah, too bad we can't get rid of the music completely, huh? Yeah! Everybody has to bend a little. We're gonna let them do this to us? No Whoa. way. Okay! Starring Michael Brandon, Eileen Brennan, and Martin Mall. Special concert appearances by Jimmy Buffett. That's all right. Yeah, be rockin' and a rollin' on a living on Saturday night. And Linda Ronstadt. 
problem with that one though is as much as I love 70s music, this is late 70s music. So it's all Steely Dan, Eagles, uh, Steve Miller bands in there. Jimmy Buffett and Linda Ronstadt both are in the movie and performing. Are we against Linda Ronstadt now? I don't care for her music, but that's fine. Uh, I know there's fans out there. It's just not it's not my it's not my not my vibe. That's fine. Bob Seeger is in it. It's not the seventies movies I like. I'm a uh yeah, if it's late seventies, I want some early punk, I want some funk, maybe even a little bit of disco. I'll I'll go with that's fine too. But this one at the end of FM, it's all, uh, they, they fire the guy who's running it, who's been running it very well because the corporate guys come in and take over and then they all go on strike. So you got one movie that's good doing uh, the co-op route. Another movie that when they don't get uh, the way that the workers want, they go on strike. Hmm. I thought this is this is a weird little uh, weird little tract of 70s movies. There's one I found late 80s called Underground Aces. It's all about uh, valet workers at a, like parking cars. It's 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 pretty it's fine. <laughs> what do we always make fun of a movie for being aggressively fine? Yes. It's, I mean, that's, yeah, I think, yeah. Um, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's a hangout movie in the early eighties with, in my opinion, a shitty soundtrack. It's mostly eighties music, whatever, you know, some of the shenanigans are funny and some of them aren't. And, uh, that's what that one is. And then, uh, sorry. Uh, also a 78 movie. I watched with a very young Jeff Goldblum running a disco called thank god it's friday that has an amazing uh although very small uh donna summer performance where she gets to actually sing too um but it's all it's all set in one night around the people that uh work at and run a disco uh also the commodores are in it so great music i mean i have to admit you have been aggressively more vigilant on this subject than i have well, that itch really got me where I was like, what is going on in the late 70s? And I don't have an answer for it, but there's a bunch of shit in the late 70s. It's all just like set over like one day or one evening or one shift or whatever, but also all around like where people are working at. I mean, they're just all ripping off Nashville, right? Um, Not very well, but possibly. Okay. I mean, part of it is this. even, you know, even in a sense, you know, car wash doesn't exist without Nashville, right? Except that car wash is like, a great, 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 great movie. And it's interesting. It's interesting that it sounds like that's the only one that makes it, but yeah, it sounds like you have, you have a, you have a trend. Right. And I don't, I don't know what sparked it. I mean, probably like you said, like Nashville, like, Hey, let's just hang out with these characters for a minute. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of them are overtly saying something, uh, like I was saying with like star hops and, um, FM, as far as what we were looking for in these movies where like, you know, the workers are, well, it actually, in both cases, it's like the workers are also the owners, which is kind of interesting. Well, it's also a period, the last period in American history of major labor unrest, like mm -hmm. the 70s, which is always something you can kind of tell is there. So maybe that has something to do with that. I'm not sure. I don't know. Well, I, I think some of it might be the way that filmmakers are coming into the industry in the in the late 60s, early 70s. Well, at this point, actually, this is more late 70s, so that may not be true. We're like there actually is a connection because like they've had to work these jobs while, like while they were trying to, you know, get into the industry as it were, although not, not these aren't all necessarily like industry films, but nonetheless, I don't know. It was interesting. There's some, a serious trend. And I, I mentioned early on, like maybe I'll just hang out in the seventies and just, you know, uh, watch this just to get like a real in-depth look at whatever the trends may be. But our watch challenge was, you know, different decades. So that's why I mapped out the uh, different decade stops that we've been doing as the the main chunk of the show. Well, I'm going to throw in a couple movies. I think I may have already mentioned, honestly, but, you know, they're watchable for this month. But uh, from 2014, you should really watch Pride, which is about, I mean, I mentioned it before, but it's a LGBTQ solidarity with coal miners uh, in Britain facing off against Thatcher. <laughs> With the strike now entering its fourth month and in the face of unprecedented violence, the government today insisted that it will close 20 pits with the loss of over 20,000 jobs. Without that pit, these villages are finished. Mining communities are being bullied just like we are. What they need is cash. Yeah, because the miners have always come to our aid, haven't they? It doesn't they? matter. It's the right thing to do. So we are going to pick a mining town completely at random. Uh, Wales. Oh my 
to everybody. Name me of the group you represent in this case. Lesbians and gay support the miners. Well, I'm hoping you can clear something up for me about lesbians. It did surprise me. Well, let me get settled in first, shall we? Who? A gaggle of gays and lesbians has come out in favor of the miners' strike. Oh, right. I was thinking of the swimming movie. It's a good movie. I will say, you know, it's a little much. Uh, I mean, it, it teeters on the edge of of sappy, but it, I don't think it goes over the edge. And it does have to work a little to get a happy ending since ultimately the coal miners do like lose historically. But it has maybe the best version of Bread and Roses I've ever heard. And Bread and Roses is my favorite socialist song. It's incredible. And then, you know, like there's things like Coal Miner's Daughter. I really meant to talk about but we didn't really get a chance to uh, proud, the, uh, proud Valley with Paul Robeson. And then, you know, I very carefully and intentionally did not include Maitwan in all of this because it felt too obvious. But really, if you haven't seen John Sills' Maitwan, you should see it. If you want, you know, if you, if you want to see James Earl Jones toss people around and have a bloody showdown with the fucking Pinkertons or whatever, uh, you know, and interracial unionism, Mm-hmm. You know, and not just the interracial, but the Italians and 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 the black workers and and the native white workers getting over their differences and bodily you know, bodily defeating the bosses is this is the place to go. So, like, yeah, there's a lot more minors minor movies that I could have chosen. I think I tried to I tried to pick ones that I didn't really know particularly well. And I kind of succeeded at that, but I did not go as in depth as you uh, in terms of like things being a project. And I, I kind of regret that. Tell the truth. You got distracted with anime. I did not get, well, I mean, all right. I admit it. I, I did spend a whole week going through Castlevania repeatedly. Cause that is literally some of the best animated action I've ever seen. And I also might've started catching up on some of my blockbusters from the last year. And I've had a little bit of a Kung Fu um uh obsession of late uh so i had to watch knockabout and i'm finishing up i have a, a a list of about 35 movies you can see them on my letterbox from the 80s 70s and 60s and i'm working my way back in time that have just been long time movies that i mean, meant to watch and i've been finishing those up i actually my last one from the 80s is coming right up it's um uh personal problems by uh bill gunn bill gunn yeah, I've just been holding off on it because it's like it's like three and a half hours long, and it's like when do I have the time for this? But like you're gonna do it, you're gonna work through. Um, but it's 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 my desire to get the complete Bill Gunn collection. There's only one more movie to get, and I have no idea how I'll watch it. Is it Stop? I believe it is Stop. Yes. Well, it's the no, but you only did three movies, so I was guessing it's that one. Yeah. So I got I distracted. Think, I think the problem I, you you ran into though was that there just weren't that many films about minors that were being made in the '80s. Well, May Twin, I guess, like you're saying, but yeah, May Twin is it. Also, being a show called The Politics of Cinema with the premise that we have, in which the films aren't neutral, um, John Sales is one of those like it's it's okay to not focus on him this particular month because we will be getting to John Sales at some point. We, we will we will be doing a lot of John Sales at some point because he is like our guy, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he lines up in so many different ways with just everything that uh, we love in film and just in general, but. You know, we're not putting out four episodes a week, so it's going to take a minute to get to John Sales. But uh, for some reason, before we get to John Sales on this show, we got to talk about Barbershop from 2002 because I picked this movie. And if you're unfamiliar with Barbershop, it's uh, I guess everybody would call it like an Ice Cube movie, even though in this case you didn't write it or direct it. I probably really should have picked Players Club, which was I was debating between this and Players Club. This one was set in 2002, so it's a, or shot in 2002, so it's a little bit later than Players Club. So I wanted to get a t- early 2000s movie in, and it ended up being Barbershop, a day in the life of a South Side Chicago barbershop. It began as just another day on the South Side of Chicago. All right, now listen up. Give me your and your joint won't be no problem. Eddie, <laughs> just leave the boys alone. Sit down. It became. An extraordinary day at the barber shop. I need a cut. A little off the top, long in the back, but not quite no shag. Slope to the left like Gumby. Eddie Monster in the front, a little white cliff on the right. Come on, hook that up, fuck. From MGM Pictures and the producers of Soul Food and Men of Honor. Hey, hey. Ah, my finger! 
You wanna know how I really feel about you? Just think about that baby face song. Which one? You know, that Adela. Yeah, well, you know, all of them, baby. If you don't pay the property taxes, the bank is gonna foreclose on the shop. I made your father the same offer, but you're a better businessman. You got vision. How could you sell this place? You know we're trying to get our recording studio off the ground. You can't give this up. Ice Cube. Your father wouldn't put up with this mess. Do I look like my father? Yeah. Yeah, you do, man. Pretty much in the nose. Anthony Anderson. Sean Patrick Thomas. Eve. And Cedric the Entertainer. Yo, Daddy, he believed that something as simple as a little haircut could change the way a man felt on the inside. Sometimes, finding the strength Get out. to do what's right. Here go your money back. I'm putting it right here on the table. Man, you're going to take this money. You're going to take this money. It's in the people. We can't talk straight in the barbershop. Then where can we talk straight? Right beside you. So that trailer is the, I mean, it's 2002 technically, but it's like the movie guy who voiced all the trailers in the 90s. Like, it is the whitest narration to this film you could have possibly put together. I don't know how anybody involved with this film saw this trailer and was like, yeah, that'll sell this film. It's terrible. And yet, this is a franchise movie. Oh, my God. It's it's crazy. It's, right? um, yeah, no, it's uh, it's this movie. It did um, Barbershop 2 back in business a couple years later. It did Barbershop the TV series, started off in 2005. It did Beauty Shop in 2005 as well, and then came back with Barbershop, the next cut in 2016. Here's the weird thing about that lineup. Hmm. The Rotten Tomatoes universe of how you score a movie, best yeah. movie of that bunch, is yeah. Barbershop, the next cut, the most recent one. Really? Yeah. Fourth movie into it, and it's the best one, or best best reviewed one on Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, it's possible. I, I can believe it. Yeah. I These things are possible. Look, here's the thing about this movie. I basically think they effectively pull off the hanging out. Yeah. Just sort of what this is about. Yeah. I get what they're going for and the value of it. It doesn't like make me laugh out loud too much, but like I basically enjoyed it or I felt I almost made me feel nostalgic for the time in a sense, you know, for 2002, for 2002, Two, but honestly, I could also go with 1999, frankly, (laughs) maybe, you know, like I think it's, I think it's fine. You know, I don't think it's a bad movie. I don't think it's a great movie. I think it's kind of slow. Yeah. It, it's not actually that long. And yet there, there does seem to be pacing issues. I think it feels long. I think it feels long. Yeah. I mean, it's uh hour 40. I want to say, I think it was like, yeah, it was like an hour 40. Um, I probably would have guessed closer to two just because of some of the pacing problems there. Yeah. Uh, it does have a nice Keith David cameo, but is there any other kind? Nope, there isn't. Well, there's nice and there's scene stealing. Awesome. I guess maybe, I mean, I think he's scene stealing. He's definitely scene stealing the whole way through. Um, I, I wanted a bit more of he and ice cube together. Cause I think those two could do some pretty interesting work. Well, especially if you're going to go, you know, more on the comedy than the drama end, but those scenes are more the drama part of this movie. Well, it's interesting because I was watching, I, I listened to some of the commentary. I got the DVD out from the library. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like they got Keith, Keith David because they needed somebody who could intimidate Ice Cube. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, no, that is, I mean, they're literally like, we need somebody who on the screen, you believe that Ice Cube is intimidating. It's like, right. yeah. David is Bill Duke that. available or is Keith David available? Right. Yeah. That's who you're going to get. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it works. Yeah, um, I I enjoy the banter. I actually enjoy some of the uh, the the political debate. I don't have any comment on you know. It's interesting to hear people talk about reparations since reparations is an important thing right now. Mm-hmm. Um, personally, I'm for them, but you know, there's perfectly legitimate uh, arguments all around. You know, so like, but it's just yeah. I mean, this, the pacing isn't quite there. It just doesn't. I mean, it's miles ahead of Empire Records, but at a certain level, like. You know, most of the stuff is super generic. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's. Um, I, think, I think it's a, the main thing is that there's not a surprise in the whole thing. No, well, okay, there was one surprise for me. So the I, the the basic premise that we've got here is um, Ice Cube. I know he's playing a character, but I mean, like we talked about with uh, Norm George Went on the Gung Ho episode, 
he's culturally ice cube no matter what he's playing yes i think he's like calvin in this one but anyway so ice cube is running his dad's barber shop he's a little bit he's a little bit into it now his dad passed away and left him the shop year maybe i don't know not too long two two years two Two years. years okay so he's been doing it a little bit and he decides he wants to get his recording studio going he's got dreams he doesn't want to have that burden of like continuing like the legacy family business so he wants to do something else he wants to make it on his own so he sells the shop for like 20 grand to Keith David, who's going to turn it, keep the name Barber Shop, but he's going to turn it into a, like a strip club peep show, something other, probably a brothel. He's a, you know, dealing in the black market here. And then he immediately, not immediately, but he learns to regret it over the course of like a day or two here. And no, it's a day. Sorry. It's all set in one day. He comes to regret selling it over the course of the day and has to figure out. He regrets it pretty quick. Do you think so? Yeah, I kind of feel like, he, I mean, he learns to regret all of it. So part of, sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just want to make sure that the premise was out there for anybody who hasn't seen it. Yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, the, the, way the, the way the screenplay is structured in like a such a perfect like paint by number screenplay, like you don't outwardly see, I guess maybe you don't outwardly see him doing anything about how he regrets it until at least the halfway to maybe two thirds mark. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I Maybe it's just because I just saw it coming. I mean, he's already uncomfortable with it. It just doesn't, you know, you know, one thing that would have helped hmm. maybe more. We hear about his schemes and we see his studio that he's he's going to become a big, you know, uh, a big producer or something in his basement like Burn. We, maybe we need to see more of that. You're like a we, montage of other failed ventures or something. Yeah, something to anchor it. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of like what would have made the stakes feel more. I mean, obviously the stakes are like there, but like I don't, you don't feel it quite as much as you should. I don't, I would have gone a different route. Like, cause I, I, I like the last note I wrote when I was watching this was um, this movie should start with a final shot, uh, except for the apple juice joke, which just drove me nuts the whole movie. Um, cause you just, it's another one of the things you just see it coming. Oh, let's give this character a quirky trade. Oh, somebody's always drinking her apple juice. Um, hilarious. As, as, as a level of apple juice that made me, you know, like really uncomfortable. I don't like, need, but I don't need the, I don't need the stakes in this movie. Like what are the stakes in car wash? You can make that uh, hangout movie like this work and just be about the characters and build the characters up better instead of having these, you know, um, archetypal stereotype whatever you want to call them characters you're like oh you're the so-and-so character that works here oh you're the such and such character there. oh you're the female character who works here like they're th- like take the time to just hang out with these these interesting people that are clearly all from the neighborhood and involve like the neighborhood a bit more and do a little bit more of their background with the neighborhood and have that come out through just hangout dialogue um it just felt too it felt too much like, okay, here's how you write a screenplay. And you have your plot point here, you know, your pinch points are here, your dramatic arcs are here. And then you just filled everything in. You're like, yeah, yeah, officially. Yeah. That's all there. But like, there isn't, I don't know. There's just, it wasn't like a heart to it that I felt. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I got the feeling of their connection to the community. Um, yeah. People just keep filtering through. I mean, there's, that's like the easiest thing to do. Right. Like it's so obvious how you do that. But like, I get what you mean. Like the conflicts lack drama because you kind of know where they're all going. I mean, yes. Yeah. Um, when as soon as the conflicts are introduced, it's it's the it's a complaint you had with Empire Records, which was which was dead on. Where you're right. like, you have all these things here, you have all these pieces. Like, don't do something with them. Oh, you're not doing anything with them. I feel like they, like they do like the most obvious thing with them, but you do get the arcs and you do get to see them play out. So this is the thing. The difference is that I think everything here connects. Like the thing about Empire Records is just things just appeared out of nowhere. Whereas by and large, I'm not saying 100%, like basically everything does. It's just not original enough or interesting enough. It's very paint by numbers. But like- In Barbershop? Yeah, in Barbershop. Yeah, right. no, not, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's not paced well enough. But the reason it's like a step above is the people are more talented and they're can still considerably more interesting, interesting yes. than- Anyway. Every, Oh, I mean, I would. And one of my records, yeah, for sure. I would look. I would watch Dinka, our very stereotypical African immigrant, get up the courage to ask the cute girl out for hours before watching Empire Records again. Right. As generic and stereotypical as that is, it is at least something happening <laughs> that I mildly care about. 
Right. And the basic underlying point of a black barbershop being a center of community and that it not being about the money and, you know, ultimately that your, your wealth is, you know, that this is a community center that helps a community that, that is, you know, in many ways a lifeline and a place for, I mean, honestly, we were talking about this, the, the, the scene where uh, Cedric, the entertainer basically lectures Ice Cube about why this place is important and basically says, look, this is where you take people who have just gotten out of jail and give them a profession. That's what your father was doing. I mean, not just out of jail, but that is actually literally one of the examples, including one of the people there. Like that is, this is, you know, this is a place of, of uplift and a, uplift and a place of potential dignity in a world that does not give us a lot of dignity. I get that. And I think that actually that, that scene for me worked. And if that had been brought home more clearly and more skillfully and with fewer stereotypes and more full characters, this could be a really good movie. Right. And now it's an okay movie. It's yeah. not a bad movie by any means. No. What? So my overall impression after watching this movie, honestly, like the, the most apt comparison I had was it feels like an above average Hallmark Christmas film. Oof. Which I mean, that's a soft spot for a lot of people, and I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll plead guilty to that on on occasion around around the holidays. But it's predictable. You know where all the arcs are going to go by the end of it. It's about saving like a legacy or family business and what it means to the community. Even though this is in Chicago, which is a huge, uh, huge city, it's specifically in like a very um, tight knit South Side Chicago neighborhood, and it means something to them. And it means something to all of the characters that are there. And it's that whole like saving the business thing. Although they don't go the Empire Records route and have like a big concert or a big, you know, haircut a thon or something at the end to raise the money to pay for everything. Uh, they end up using the cops to save the day. So that's a whole thing. But mm -hmm. it's a paint by numbers movie with occasional heart and some style and, you know, a little, little flair here and there, which is why I'm saying it's an above average Hallmark. Christmas film. It's just not set at Christmas. That's just the right. template though. Like the, it's an easily digestible movie that has, you know, some moments where you're like, Oh, Hey, how about that? Um, and then the rest of it's just kind of forgettable and predictable and you're on to the next thing. Well, and, and part of it is this, I mean, we, neither of us, neither of us are black, nor are we part of communities in which barbershops play that particular role. So the potential emotional resonance or the sense of nostalgia that this movie may create is frankly not one that either of us are able to tap into at an emotional level. That's a really good point. I have not even, I, I've been cutting my own hair since high school. Like I haven't even been into even like a mall, like, you know, great clips or anything like that since I don't like decades. Yeah. Yeah. There, I'm, I, there is something that I could, I'm just missing there experientially speaking. Well, but it, but also it's that this is, this is playing a particular, because of sort of the racial, pol the racial political economy of the United States, this is also playing a role that like, I do go and get haircuts, but I'm still not going to have that experience, necessarily that experience. Right, 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 right. So it's, yeah, it's just, it's not, you know, you're not going to, we're just not going to quite grasp why this would create as much nostalgia. I think we're right probably about the overall quality, but like one of those Hallmark movies or like any sort of like relatively rote comedy but with competent people doing it, right? Good actors, you know, the whole deal, right? Right. What what makes it work and grab you is more than that. I have, but there is another problem with this, which I'm going to come with right now. And I think you know it's coming, right? Which is, this is not, the, this is a movie in which the main character is the boss. Right. So this would functionally be like, instead of Empire Records, if we'd chosen- High Fidelity. High Fidelity. Well, Which, it's a, it's a owner worker though, too, I think, you know, some of the worst, cases. some of the worst jobs you can have is with people like that. True. Although I don't think either one of those movies are an example of that. Well, uh, part of it is, is, that, I mean, okay, well, to be fair, he makes a horrible decision and that's the whole premise for this. Right. The worst arc right. of the movie. Um, but no, I guess, um, I guess what, I, what I'm saying is that in a sense, it, it's an awkward fit within our themes because in, it is a movie about work, but it's not a, a movie in which you even have the potential for antagonism, or certainly not a movie that will represent any. Well, I, what we can say is, at an ideological level, like it will not represent the antag the potential antagonism between the workers at the barbershop and the owner. Wait, is it's not what? There isn't going to be class struggle in this movie. Oh well, 
there is at the end, which could have been more interesting when they realize like, oh, wait, you just sold us out from underneath ourselves and didn't consult anybody and do true. anything. You're right. You're right. Uh, I take it all back. But then also that scene actually only means something as an audience member, because like there is a sting when he reveals like, oh, hey, I sold this to like the local uh, two bit gangster guy who's going to turn this new strip club. You're all the jobs as of when I close in like five minutes like there that you know as predictable as the movie is that's still a scene that like that that hurts can you feel that on all their faces because we've spent time with them and got to know them even if some of them are kind of very two-dimensional if not offensively stereotyped characters it it still stings which because we've spent a lot of time i mean i didn't clock at screen time wise but i think screen time um ice cube as we'll mention with uh molly mcguire's in a second is front and set well actually not even front and center on the poster but he's the marquee name because he's Ice Cube in 2002, he's gonna he's selling tickets to your movie, but it's kind of a collective share of the screen. Sure, which is what we hope for a movie like this, right? And also, we were picking this movie sight unseen just because it like it looked like it it fit the things out the themes I was going for. Also, I didn't make this movie. Don't blame me for this movie. I I too late. Um, <laughs> That's fine. You, I'll take it. You 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 knew from the description. Come on now. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it's it, you know it may not be the absolute class struggle classic, but the next movie that we have, whoo, talk about struggling, uh, is is definitely about struggle and is definitely about class struggle and is about the desperation of when you've hit the bottom of the line, right? And what do you have left but to blow shit up? We're talking about the Molly Maguires. They were Irish. They were Catholic. They were rebels. They are all over the coalfields, calling themselves the Molly Maguires after some gang of cutthroats back in Ireland. I warn you now, God will judge last night's violence as a sin. There's no future for what you joined except hell. In Pennsylvania, in the Pennsylvania coal mines in 1876, a group of Irish immigrant workers begin to retaliate, uh, retaliate against the cruelty of their work environment. That kind of gets it across, or it definitely gets it across. I mean, that is what's happening. But part of what we're start, what basically what this is a movie about is it is based off of real history. It's not representing the history completely correctly, but basically you're having a mine workforce, which is basically 100% Irish, it seems like. Maybe there's some Welsh in there. Everybody's from the British Isles. Everybody's immigrants who have just come off of a brutal six month, historic six month strike, which they have lost. And so they're using uh, what the Hibernians, which is a, a perfectly legal, you know, secret society, right? Like the Masons or something like that, which in the 19th century is like what everybody does. And using that as cover for acts of sabotage and violence in retaliation against the bosses. By and large, without clear demands, there's only one point where you can sort of figure that out, figure out a demands. And our main character, so I was just thinking about this as a trope, actually. I mean, because, you know, we just had, um, we just had a movie uh, this year that used this trope. And I don't think actually as well structurally, but basically, um, you have Richard Harris playing a spy who is sent in to join the Molly Maguires, root them out, and destroy them. And he's our entryway character into all this and our yeah. main character. It's secretly a cop movie. I mean, I guess what I was making reference to oh, Judas the Black Messiah, which I think has more structural problems than this. I don't think it pulls it off. Well, I think they're almost on equal footing, to be honest, because this one, I think, would have been more effective if we don't know oh shit i don't want to well no it's it's a movie from decades ago there's uh no i don't want to i don't want to fuck with that movie let's say like um the original fast and furious like we know paul walker is a cop going in to go undercover Mm -hmm. there's there's a better narrative punch you could uh pull off if we don't know he's a cop until maybe like halfway through like he can just be the new guy in town and we're going along with the ruse of him just being like the new guy in town with whatever, you know, bullshit past he makes up or whatever, which also is kind of cool that Sean Connery doesn't buy his quick bullshit story um, when he gives it to him. But then if you see him meet up with um, 
uh, the Frank Finley character, the uh, police uh, captain, like see him meet up with a police captain like halfway through or two thirds way through and be like, wait, fucking what? Like that'd be a revelatory scene. And then you'd be riveted right through the climax. I think by tipping the hat or, 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 you know, showing that he's, he's in with the police from the beginning ish, you know, the first 20, 30 minutes, it robs it of some potential from a narrative point of view, I think. But, you know, I mean, not that this movie is going for this, frankly, but I, I think that gives up the potential for Hitchcockian suspense, right? Knowing, knowing uh, great more tension. I don't know. I mean, I think that's what, so Judas and the Black Messiah, I think is a better movie overall. Yeah. I, yeah, think, yeah. It's more, I think it's a more uneven movie. I think Judas and Black Messiah's highs are incredibly high. It just doesn't hold together as a total film because you make this particular decision in this. It's more just that we've got, kind of a reprehensible person who we're supposed to sympathize with. And I think that sympathy would line up better that like, I'd be more sympathetic to him if he was like our audience character taking us through and then has the about face or, you know, the turnaround at some point. Cause yeah. really to me, it was just sort of like, okay, I don't like, I don't even like what you're doing. You're going in undercover to root out the, like, yeah, I was like, I, no. So like, I'm immediately not on board with the audience character in this movie. So one of the things that I think would actually have helped this is you need you have two very strong leads in this movie. You have Sean Connery and Richard Harris. I actually think you could have played into their friendship more. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see that a lot more. Yeah. I think that would have helped a lot because part of it is the tension, the tension that you're supposed to get is, is he going to betray them? And you do feel, or even if he's a spy, is he going to keep doing this? And you do feel that, right? Like you do get that. Because he, you know, by the end of the movie, he's actually actively trying to prevent them from doing stuff that'll get them in trouble. He's, he's, he's turned, I, you know, I think there's some good subtle work in this movie. And I think there's also an interesting, I mean, we'll get into the political perspective of this. I mean, this is, this is about brutal class conflict, right? I mean, in some ways, some of the most brutal that the country, our country's ever had. And actually, I'm just going to just quickly say, before we keep going with this, this is, I think, really great set design. It's really be- beautifully shot. And they spend a lot of time in the mines making you watch it, including child labor and the whole thing. So one of the things that they keep basically arguing for why we're doing this violence, right? Why we've gone to this level is they're killing us. And you can see that. Right. They show that. You believe that these people are being wasted away. I think you really, I mean, it is, you know, you really feel the desperation. Well, I mentioned it on our How Green Is My Valley episode about how like not too much, uh, not too much in the mines on this film for being like, we're all miners. Wasn't a ton in the, in the mines in uh, How Green Is My Valley. And this film more than makes up for it because right. there's a lot of stuff in the mines here. Um, also, as you're mentioning, you know, uh, how well it's shot, we should give a quick uh, shout out to James Wong Howe because this was one of his final uh, feature films that he was cinematographer for um, best known for his Oscar winning work on uh, the Rose tattoo and HUD probably HUD's probably, you know, one of the more famous ones seconds with a uh, John Frankenheimer is pretty stellar. Um, if you're a musical fan, he shot funny lady guy could do everything started off in silent cinema and made it all the way up into the seventies. So uh, congrats to him. That's like a hundred and you know, 50 some cinematographer credit career right there. But yeah, no, it's, 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 um, actually I even, I, I jokingly wrote in my notes at one point about how I said, uh, you know, how green is my Valley. It's a black and white film. We didn't get to see how green the Valley was. There's a scene where Richard Harris heads out of, uh, heads out of the town that everybody's in with, uh, Samantha Egger who's playing Mary and has a picnic and they talk about how green it is out there. And she's like, yeah, where we live, like everything's just covered in soot all the time. Like, yeah, cause it's fucking terrible. It's all, it's a mining town. This is not where you want to live. Right. And you feel that though, like the, like it, it, it hit my eyes. I was like, holy shit, it's really green right now. And then they start talking about it because they're actually out of the, the mining town. Right. I don't know if it's, I mean, it's good set design. It's good production value. I don't think it's necessarily good for like, obviously the planet it's mining. Um, it's not good for the area you want to live in, but the area that they shot this film in, in Northeastern Pennsylvania in the late sixties, there's a. I, don't know if, I think it's really a joke. It was like an anecdote I read in a review, for, a contemporary review of this movie, saying that the town had changed so little since the 1870s when the film is is set that all they had to do before they shot started shooting was remove television antennas from the houses. Interesting. I was like, oh, 
really? Like, that's gross. Do I, mean, I sort of interrupted. Do we want to sort of get into more of how it, it, you know, the ways we don't think it quite lands? I mean, I think it's a good movie, but it's, I think it's supposed to be a great movie, right? It's trying for great things. Um, and I, I, I think it hits a few of them. I like how on the side, I don't know how to word this. I like how it's just like, yeah, we bomb shit. We're taking on the man. That's what we're doing. Like, there's no judgment to like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're setting, but there's no character that's just like, oh my God, I can't believe you're shooting. Well, there's the priest, but that guy's- Actually, I, I think there's a bunch of characters. I mean, there's, there's there's a priest and there's, um. so Richard Harris's character is staying at a woman in her father's house. Like they have a room to let. And right. then he sort of woos her. And, you know, he's a, uh, the, the, the father is a former miner who's been wasted by the mines and is close to Sean Connery's character. And she's totally against the violence, right? Like, I don't think it puts the audience on her side, though. I think it puts the audience on the side of, of Richard Harris and Sean Connery. Well, let's get into what this movie is actually about in a, a second or what I think it's actually about. But let's figure out there's a flaw. Is the movie saying the movie, I think, clearly the violence is justified but right. are the consequences of the uh, violence is is technically justified but are the consequences of it effective because in a lot of ways they basically end up with the violence that the that they're carrying out is like self-immolation right it's not you know it's not going to stop this it's not going to do anything they can't win they will get caught they will get isolated and defeated and i I, I think there's a reason this came out in 1970. Yeah, because it's like until you were even mentioning how this movie isn't focused on two years earlier when it was like the strike. It's focused on, I mean, the narrative starts up like right afterwards where it didn't it didn't work out for them. Well, in real history, his Richard Harris's character, this is all, you know, really happened. The Molly Maguires are supposedly real. Though it's not clear that they did whatever they did, their trials. So part of what's different than the, than the history, as I understand it, is how do I put this? Basically, it's never it was it, their trials. Um, whereas in this, it's very clear that they're guilty and they've been captured, and that's important to make the point because okay, I think this is about the weathermen. It's about the new left spiraling out of control. It's about the despair of failed revolutions. I'm just going to say that and just jump back real quick. But in in real life, it's not proven. And in fact, it, I think in, in, the, in the late 20th century, the state of Pennsylvania actually overturned, like gave pardons to everybody involved in this. Like these are actually like dirty anti-labor trials in real life. And Richard Harris's character, the character that Richard Harris is playing, apparently after they started, after the, uh, the company Goon started killing women and children or going after women and children, actually quit his job. That's what actually happened. But in order to make the point about like the new left and where you were in 1970 or 1969 and, you know, the beginning of the weathermen, maybe, you know, all of that, you actually, they have to be guilty. And this has to be sort of a point of revolutionary despair. Yeah. No, I think that's dead on. Um, I mean, it's a little, I think early at the time of production was basically when the weather underground was splitting off from SDS, but that wasn't like that was when that idea started like you you, like you're right with like the um the new left in the late 60s so i think it does work as a it does work very well as a comment on that i don't think it's an effective comment in the long run but no actually hearing that about the 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 trial too is interesting because the way the trial is portrayed in the movie well it was one of those i was like well this is a foregone conclusion like obviously they're going to be sent away so it's actually i think probably a good move on the movie's part that they didn't really like prolong the trial period scene wise there's not a lot of scenes of it it's pretty quick hey i'm a cop what you're a cop it's revealed everybody holy shit what the hell everybody's sentenced and then you have the final sequence where richard harris is talking to sean connery in prison which is what you just alluded to earlier where like sean connery is basically just like well i got nowhere to go i got nothing to do i'm it's completely ineffective this truck didn't work guess we're just gonna blow shit up time to just you know burn out well, it's, it's, you know, we've got to, defiance is dignity, right? Like, we right, right, right. grab this little spark and be alive and show them, show them just a little bit. You know, your only agency is to uh, fuck with them. Like, what else, well, I mean, what else are you going to do? You know, he's, he's, uh, he's not, well, not, he's, he's the Boars and Princess Mononoke, uh, to make a very random reference to it. <laughs> it, it, it works, though. But they also, they do a good job within this, the structure of the, of the narrative to show that, like, 
this isn't an option of just like, oh, let's just go move to a different town, find different work. Right. You're right. Everybody actually cannot financially get out. This is a company town. It's a company town. There's no option for that. Even um, uh, Mary, the Samantha Egger part, when Richard Harris, who clearly does have actual feelings for her. Um, so again, it's kind of hard to tell where his allegiances are at. He talks to her in the courtroom after the decisions have been made, after the people, after Connery and, the, and this crew are in jail, by like, no, you could still go with me. You could still. So like, she's even still giving an out, but you know, she morally, she's like, I'm not going somewhere with you. She literally says, I would have gone with anyone for, I thought that I would have gone with anyone for anything. Right. Any circumstances just to get I would have taken to, out, to just to get out. But I'm not going with you, asshole. Right. Because you're, you're, you're. You're a fucking, you're a fucking spy. And then she makes pig noises and walks out of the courtroom. The other thing in real life, in, in the movie, he's a rando that they hire to do this. In real life, he was a Pinkerton. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, that's why I think, I mean, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be like a huge plot point that you hold to the end. I think you could still have your Hitchcockian suspense by knowing, oh shit, he's up to what? I think you just reveal that like 30, 40 minutes into the movie and it gives the narrative a jolt where you're like, wait, he's, because like, up to that point, you have two insanely, this is peak Richard Harris, so like the dreamiest eyes that you just fall into as soon as he pops up on screen. You have Sean Connery, uh, not, I want to say post James Bond, but in the midst of, he's already done several James Bond movies at this point. This is 1970. So you've got James Bond and Richard Harris. Like you couldn't have more, you know, Irish and Scottish dreamboats playing these like dirty ass coal miner parts. So like their charm and charisma and their chemistry, again, like you said, if you heighten their friendship or they click uh, you know, over that rugby scene or whatever, move that forward a little bit in the plot. And you've got like this friendship dynamic going on and then reveal that one of them is clearly just going to sell them all out by the end. And he's a cop. You've got that, like a much more interesting, I guess, sort of twist at like a 30 or 40 minute mark. And then it becomes from the audience's point of view, Oh shit. Like, how is he going to screw him over? Oh my God. He's actually kind of, are they changing his mind? Is he actually on board with them? And until you get to the I don't know, two thirds uh, ish mark in the screenplay when he's actually like setting the uh, offices on fire with Sean Connery. You're like, oh my God, he switched sides. He's with these guys now. Like, I, I think you'd have a different arc and it would, it would, it would, it would, uh, it would propel the narrative a bit better from an audience point of view to, to the end when you get that courtroom scene. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. You know, and, and part of it is this there is enough going on between them that the final scene in, in the jail where Sean Connery, where they talk very amiably up until the point that Sean Connery attacks him. But basically Sean Connery is like, time he tries to choke him to death. Yeah. Right. Which, you know, is a perfectly reasonable. Fine. Yeah. But, you know, like, but, you know, part of it is Sean Connery saying like, you know, at the end, it's like, yeah, we've been talking amiably about all this, but like you, what you really want is absolution, right? Mm-hmm. You want a way out and you're not fucking getting it. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, is the choking meant to, I'm trying to remember, is the choking meant to give him that? Like, Oh yeah, maybe a little bit. It's supposed to give him that, but then he says like, look, this isn't going to work. It felt satisfying as an audience member to see that scene. Sure. But, I mean, part, but yeah. I mean, he sort of says like, that none, none of that will actually be enough in the end. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good, but I think, yeah, all the elements of it could have made it great. Yeah, but it's not like we like we joked. Ugh, we just cannot stop picking on Empire Records, but fuck that movie. Um, it it's not like Empire Records were like there's nuggets within that story where you're like there's something good in here. You just didn't do it. This one's really close, right? It's really close. Is there's just a, a few structural changes over because you are dealing with great actors with lots of charisma and all the sort of technical stuff that you could need and a really compelling story. Yeah. And you've got, um, again, a spectacular, like legendary level cinematographer. Um, and also you've got um, Martin Ritt, the director he had at this point in time, but he goes on to direct uh, Norma Ray. Like he's got an, an, an interest in social issue dramas and is, is pretty adept at them. Likes his strikes. He does. He does. Uh, not, not an accident. Well, that makes us all the more makes the sort of new left angle on this all the more interesting. I mean, that for in, in this, like, this is a movie, in a sense, I'm going to go back. If you remember nearly, oh, a year ago, when we were embarking upon the summer of the 60s. Mm-hmm. Dear listeners, if you haven't listened to our summer of the 60s, it's good stuff. And I will always bring, you know, always say that my great regret with that, I think it was great, but that it would have been better if we'd made it to 72, because that's the real end of the 60s. This actually would have been a great movie for that series. 
Yeah, I think so. It would have fit in really well. And like some of the movies that we did there, some of the movies, most of the movies I think we did in the flat were very good. A few of them were like not great, but totally got across our themes. And this is a movie that would totally have gotten across the themes of the period. Right. Well, because also we were watching all those in order, in bulk, you know, over the course of a few months. So it it highlighted, st- well, I don't we need another ad for that series. We talk about it all the time, but it it was a very interesting way to watch movies and heightened average movies to a level of more importance because you're getting the context in which they actually came out for once. Right. And actually now that I think, yeah, maybe this brought me back to that a little bit, you know? Yeah. 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 For sure. That being said, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't a hundred percent land, but that's, that's okay. There's enough there though, that it's, um, you know, it's one of those, like I would, I would heartily recommend it, uh, sure. for people it's, to watch. It's, it's a good movie. Yeah. That all being said, True. Um, so my original map out for the watch challenge this month was going through different decades to get to, um, I wanted to get to up to something current and looking at, as I mentioned before, the service industry work, actually, I didn't get to anything with uh, sex workers I'd planned on watching, but uh, that's fine. I'll work that in some, some other time. Um, but service industry jobs that are also set within the workplace so I'll just throw this one out as a recommendation because I have seen this one before, but it was the one I kind of wanted to, to cap out on. Uh, Andrew Bujalski's film from 2018, Support the Girls, uh, with Regina Hall and Haley Lou Richardson. My name is Lisa. I'm the general manager, and my girl just said you got a little disrespectful with her. <laughs> a what? Well, you might have thought you were just having a little fun, but I have a zero tolerance policy on disrespect, so uh, you're going to have to go. Blow me. This is a mainstream place. It's a little sprues and big screens. Yeah. Although I will say our strategy is moving, you know, sort of away from boobs and into butts. You're not wearing a whole lot of clothes, but it's a family place. Like working at, at Chili's or Applebee's, except the tips are way better. If you know how to work it. But notice how I open my mouth real wide when I laugh, like. <laughs> hey, hey, get off the car. It's Alexis. Oh, well, you're a mainstream bar and grill. Please come here, please come here. She's making sick money, though. Fantastic uh, comedy, although it does get... To, no, actually, it doesn't violate your rule, Isaac. She is not the owner of the establishment. That guy's a prick, and there's a scene with him. Um, you get uh, Regina Hall as the put-upon, beleaguered uh, manager of... She's she's a manager. She's a manager. Um, she, she, it, it doesn't... Here's the thing is this. It doesn't count in the sense that she is a manager, which is, like, not actually... Like, that would still be who you're class struggling against. But she's really good and it's a great movie and I think I would count it totally. It's totally a movie about working at a restaurant, that kind of restaurant. So oh, it's entirely about the work, but also I think it's interesting because it's specifically about, it's not Hooters, but it's basically Hooters. It's called double whammies. I think <laughs> <laughs> like it's um, yeah, a sport. Uh, what's the tagline here? A sports bar with curves. But it's entirely about the work. But also, I think the interesting twist that uh, Bujalski, as writer-director, put on this was that there's a sexuality inherent in the work that didn't come up in any of the other um, workplace movies that I was that, that we were looking at for this series. Right. Which is, you know, it's, it's fun to play with because you have a bunch of um, uh, smart, hilarious, and intelligent uh, female characters in this movie that it takes you behind the scenes and like, yeah, this is what they're actually doing here. And then you get to watch that play out with the customers and uh, you'll be, be in on the joke, so to speak. But no, it's actually saying a lot. And also as one of my, it was one of my top American films in 2018 when it came out and the ending to it, which I'm not going to spoil at all here is um, exactly in my opinion, how you end movies of this genre. I'll leave it at that. Fair enough. What would have been your next film, Isaac? Well, you know, I, I think I don't think I t- totally pulled off the decade challenge. I've got forties, but I've got more than one forties because Proud Valley would, you know, fit in there. Mm-hmm. I have a fifties one, which we already did. I don't have a sixties one. I do have a seventies one, though. Frankly, it straddles the line. I mentioned an eighties one. I don't have a nineties one, or exactly a two thousands one, but I do have a two thousand ten one. That's Pride. So. Did not totally pull this off. I mean, I could have, I could, the truth of it is I could name labor movies for all those decades, but I'm going to stick to what I actually said I would do. Basically, it ended up be every, every other decade. This is sometimes the way it goes. Did you say you had one for the 2000s? 
I did not have. I don't have a minor mining movie for the two thousands. I, I got one for you if you want to fill in that gap. Oh, what do we got? North Country. North Country. The what? Charlize Theron, Jeremy Renner, Francis McDormand movie. Is it good? No, I mean, I'm sorry. My no answer is not to is it good. My no answer is what I thought you were going to say was have you seen it? And no, I have not. Oh well, I guess I have to put this in my to see list because. Mining movies will probably haunt me for the rest of my days. <laughs> May as well. But also, that's also a genre you can exhaust at some point. No, I, I did like um, the director, um, Nikki uh, Caro. Nikki Caro. She's a New Zealand filmmaker. She did Whale Rider, which was a huge hit. Oh, at the um, art house we worked at for a while. Um, it was before I started working there, but I remember seeing it there uh, twice, actually. And I was like, oh, my God, this movie's great. And then uh, I don't know if Zookeeper, I'm sorry. She did Zookeeper's Wife. That's what I was thinking of. I don't know if North Country was her. I think it was her follow up to that one. So that was the usual, like coming to Hollywood and, um, you know, directing a movie in the studio system for the first time. And she picked North Country, which is an interesting pick. Much more famously now, she is the director of uh, the live action Mulan. Ouch. She has stuck around and had quite has quite the career. I don't I sorry that that's mean. I don't mean to be mean to her because I think she's. A talented director. I just mean that the live action Mulan. As a concept, I get you. Well, I mean, part of it is we've talked, we haven't talked about this since very early in the podcast, but you know, where people go after Marvel movies is sort of like the death of cinema or whatever. And I, I don't think that's true. I, I We can talk about the problematics of, of superhero movies or whatever. The actual death of cinema is live action Disney. And well, I think a global pandemic hitting at the same time live action Disney is happening is. <laughs> the death of the death it, of cinema. I mean, part of it is is that it almost feels like the death rattle. Like maybe all this is because you know it's like what what are you? What are you when you yeah. cannibalize the cannibalization? Like, ugh, God. Well, the 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 oddly perfect segue from Nikki Caro and Whale Rider and how she went into the Hollywood system starting off as an independent and going to the Hollywood system and ended up directing the live action Mulan again, no shit on her. That's her. It's her career. She can do what she wants. Mm -hmm. That is going to be a topic of conversation for our next episode. When we are going to take a look at uh, Chloe Zhao's Nomadland, the big award winner from this past year, 2020 starring Francis McDormand. And she is about to head into, if not currently in, as we're recording this right now, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, correct. Well, the first, the first, uh, the first preview for Eternals already came out. Ah, all right. So there we go. Speaking of cannibalizing uh, the independent film scene, I have some opinions on that, which we'll get into on our next episode when we're going to take a look at Nomad Land, uh, a little bit of leftist film criticism, maybe a little bit of uh, trash talk on the Oscars in general. Uh, that's always fun to do. And I've got plenty of ammo for that. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe we can point all the people who are critiquing her as if they'd never heard of who she is to maybe some of her other movies, which are very good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The writer and uh, songs of Earth taught me are uh, intense and amazing humanist dramas as is Nomadland. And uh, there's an interesting thing, which we're going to fully circle back to, I think on this episode, which we talked about on our very first episode, uh, the children of men episode, where sometimes critics are jumping to conclusions without really knowing what they're talking about. Yes. Um, which I'm sure we've done at times as well. Not Never. saying we haven't, you know, we're not innocent here, but we're completely, com completely innocent. Nope. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're totally innocent here. And, um, but yeah, the, the critiques of nomad land that we were reading that prompted us to like, let's, take a little you know let's, let's pause here a second i know it just you know won awards um by the time that episode comes out probably about a month ago but it's there's, there's some stuff here that's worth discussing um especially the the state of film criticism around this film and the natural ebb and flow that you get when a movie becomes a front runner um you have to have all these contrarian critics come out and um tell you why it's no good well you know I'll, i'm gonna save my ammo for uh for the next episode sounds good I was, I was just about to say something more, but I'm holding back, <laughs> holding back. This is also going to be a return to current movies. I don't think we've done a current movie since what, Mangrove? I don't think so off the top of my head. And it's, it's going to force really me. been uh, what I've been watching over the last year. Current, current cinema was uh, a little hard. 
Yeah, no, I, I basically right. have not. I'm, I'm basically this week. I, I've started, I watched actually, honestly, I started with like some of the blockbusters. I finally watched uh, Kong versus uh, Zilla, which, uh, you know, that, that monkey does punch. I mean, that that's all we wanted, right? Yeah. I mean, I wanted a little bit more to that movie, but that's fine. Well, okay. When you're saying it that way, it does always amaze me that that's still the same director as like the host and um, you're next because I can't tell. I'm thinking about Bong Joon-ho when you say the host. Oh, the Cersei Ronan movie? No, no, uh, not the host. The guest. I'm sorry, not the guest. The host. The guest. Oh, Adam Wingard. Yeah, Adam Wingard. Oh, so that's like, his movie. That's his movie. Yeah. Ugh. All right. Talk about selling out. Well, that's just it. Is part of it is like I I I enjoyed it well enough, but I know what you mean. I think a lot more people liked it more than I did. I appreciated the smashing, but like it didn't quite get me enough. And then I realized, and I realized he's been on. A, there's a lot, I haven't watched any of his movies in between and I know people didn't like death note, which fair enough. Um, but like, yeah, like those are like great genre movies. Yeah. And, I, and this is a genre movie. Right? It's not that great. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I think it's fine, but it's like, this is a genre movie in a venerable genre that actually has great movies and has a lot of potential for like smashing, the, you know, like look, big, big lizard versus big gorilla, you know, like, this is perfectly fine. This is a great premise for a movie. And I don't, why are we talking about this at this point? But uh, yeah, it could have been a lot better. I don't know. Ugh, we're coming back to modern movies. <laughs> yeah, we are. We are. But before we get back to modern movies on our next episode, be sure to rate and review the show and whatever podcast app you're using. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend or two. We're also up and running on Twitter, Instagram, blah, 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 blah. Just look at the show notes here. If you go to the links provided there, we've got some other, uh, you know, workers on film stuff we were promoting and recommending throughout the month. So there's other recommendations there. Other uh, curiosities we're watching and potentially enjoying. We kind of post about there that we don't end up talking about on the show. So if you need some more recommendations, give us a follow on all those links in the show notes. And until next time, I am Aaron. And I'm Isaac. And stay, fa- stay safe out there and uh, free, free Palestine. <laughs>